Our scripture reading this morning is in the Psalms again. I would invite you to turn there with me, Psalm 113. We're going to read that together, Psalm 113. It's a short psalm, uh, but it's a beautiful one. And it's one that asks the very simple question, Who is like the Lord our God? And then there's the simple answer, No one. No one is like the Lord our God. Our God stands alone as the unrivaled sovereign of the universe. And uh, because of that, he is worthy of our praise, uh, which is how the psalm both begins and how it ends. So let's read there together. Psalm 113, verse 1 says, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Then verse 4, the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks, and I love this, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. And so he has both elevated himself and he elevates, verse 7, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. And the psalm ends the same way it started, with these three words, praise the Lord. And that, as always, is our objective this morning, to praise the Lord because he is great and he is greatly to be praised. So let's open our service with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, you and you alone are the unrivaled sovereign of the universe. Who is like the Lord our God? No one. You are the creator, the great I am, the uncaused first cause, the one who is exalted, high and lifted up. Lord, you are worthy of our praise, as we've just read about, and you are worthy also of our thanksgiving, and, and namely, as we'll sing about in just a second, uh, for, for the blessed assurance that we have in Christ, uh, that he does and he will hold us fast. Uh, what more could we possibly want, or what more could we possibly need? And so, Lord, we thank you this morning. We praise you, and we worship you now in this hour. I pray you would receive praise from the lips of your people. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. The final phrase of our next song that we sing says, Praising my Savior all the day long, not just here on Sunday, but there is much to praise our God for who he is and what he has done. Let's stand here to sing, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
us to know that he will hold us fast. Even when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast.
was lovely. Thank you for that, Ellie. If you're not familiar with her, it's because she's new to our church. Uh, Ellie and Ethan were married this summer. Ethan is one of our students at Emory, and uh, you need to get to know uh, both of them if you haven't yet. Ellie, welcome. Uh, we're so glad that the Lord has brought you here. Thank you for your ministry to us. Uh, rest. Rest is so needed uh, in our souls. We talk about Jesus' invitation, come unto me, all you who weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And uh, you may arrive this morning with a tumultuous soul, uh, weary, uh, fatigued, anxious, and you find rest in the Lord. Uh, what a beautiful invitation we have. You know, I love um, hymns and just the power of, of hymn lyrics. The Lord has given us such a gift um, to, to comfort us in our most challenging times. Uh, many of you love the song we sang today, uh, He Will Hold Me Fast. And, you know, I, I love songs that have a real depth of doctrine. And that one does, but that one also has kind of a simplicity <coughs> where the main portion of it is just repeated again and again and again, not in a wearisome way, but in a comforting way. Whatever's happening, uh, the Lord holds us. I got a, an email uh, this last week from my friend Mike Harding. He's a pastor in Michigan. Many of you are familiar with the Hardings. And uh, uh, Mike is the son-in-law <coughs> of... Don and Barbara Howell, uh, who have been part of Killian Hill for a long time. And if you'll remember, um, a few months ago, their son, Luke, who uh, is a pastor up in New England, had a just terrible uh, crisis tragedy where uh, they lost their son, Hudson. Uh, he just wasn't around. They couldn't find him for just a few minutes, not long. And uh, by the time they found him, uh, he was face down in the neighbor's pond. And I think three years old, lost his life. Uh, heartbreaking. Uh, here's what Mike shared in an email this week. Uh, just what God is teaching their family through this and uh, teaching Luke and, and his family. They recently were blessed with another child. And um, he writes this, that um, they recently gathered uh, at, the tomb, uh, at, the, at the grave site. And when they gathered... Uh, they sing together with all of their children, remembering Hudson, and what they sing is, for my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. In fact, those are the very words engraved on Hudson's headstone. He will hold me fast. Uh, so the hymns that we sing, um, I hope will be a blessing to you now when we sing them, but they're also preparing you to have uh, words when, when all else fails. Maybe you need someone else to help you say something. Thank the Lord for hymns like that, even in times of grief. We do have one announcement, and then we'll uh, pray together, make this on behalf of our Awana Club. And uh, many of you know, I was in Awana Club as a kid, and uh, when you hear me quote scripture, I read the Bible and preach from the ESV, but when I quote the Bible, I quote King James, and that's because of Awana Club. I just memorized so much scripture as a kid. And uh, that made a huge impact on my life, but also they would have uh, ministry opportunities where I could serve, uh, maybe write a missionary, something like that. Well, we're giving our Awana Clubbers an opportunity to serve, and you can help. So let me just read an announcement and uh, encourage you to participate in this. Uh, this year, our Awana kids will be packaging up donations for Operation Christmas Child on Wednesday, November 18th. Our church family is invited to help provide the donated gifts. We have gift lists in the church foyer and people can take, uh, that people can take so they know what items to buy. If you cannot provide gifts but can donate some empty shoe boxes or boot boxes, the Awana ministry would be uh, greatly helped by this as well. We will have a donation table in the church foyer beginning Sunday, October 25th through Sunday, November 15th for our church family to drop off their donations and boxes. Thank you for that. And uh, I've seen videos of uh, children in difficult places that are getting that. Might be the only Christmas that they have and an opportunity for us to minister. So uh, thank you to the Awana Club leaders for working at that, Smiths especially, and uh, to our kids. And we'll do what we can to roll up our sleeves and be a help. All right, let's pray together. We thank you, Lord, that in a world that seems uh, 
so off kilter and so distressed. Uh, thank you that we, as your people, find our rest in you. Uh, the rest that you exemplified after creation when on the seventh day you, you rested. Uh, not because you're weary, uh, but because you were giving to us a gift uh, and giving us an example of resting. And now, of course, we have uh, the opportunity on the Lord's Day to have a special day of rest, a day of worship and refreshment. Uh, thank you for the rest that our souls find in you, uh, that we come to you with uh, such agitation like a tempestuous sea. And just as Jesus uh, calmed the sea with but a word, you can calm our hearts. Thank you that you give us rest. And Lord, I don't know the need of everyone uh, that is worshiping with us this morning, but you do, and I pray for you to give them peace that passes understanding, give them joy in the midst of hardship, and give them rest for their weary souls. Uh, for any who don't yet know Christ as Savior, uh, they might be looking for satisfaction and meaning elsewhere, uh, but they will find no rest until they find it in Jesus. I pray for them. I pray that you will bring them to yourself and uh, show them your great mercy and love. Uh, Lord, I pray that <laughs> you will... <coughs> Uh, through this difficult time, uh, help us to continue to grow uh, personally and to grow as a church. I pray that you will bless our, our ministry, that it will expand. I pray for our missionaries, that you will give them grace, give them perseverance, protect them. And I pray that the gospel will advance. And we long to meet people in heaven uh, who are there by your grace, but also uh, because of ministries we've participated in. So continue to build your church and uh, do a work that has no explanation other than the hand of God. Now, Lord, as we open your word, please be our teacher. Uh, open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your law. And change us with the power of your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> I'm under care from Dr. Sorg, and uh, I have kind of a new regimen of uh, medicines and he chastised me. He says, I watch you preach and you never drink any water. What is wrong with you? Uh, so every time I, I hit a major point, I'm going to take a drink of water. If I don't, I need you, Ethan, I need you to be my water guy. So if you see a major point come up, you just hold up your hand and let me know. And, uh, and hopefully that will be a help. Turn your Bibles, please, to Luke 19. going to give you some famous lines. See if you can identify where they're from. I imagine many, if not most of you can. Keep it secret. Keep it safe. You know where that comes from? I see a lot of people nodding. The shallow people in the audience are nodding because you've seen this in a movie. Uh, the deeper people in the audience are nodding because you've read it in a book. However, uh, the, these are the words that Gandalf speaks to Frodo in the Shire. Frodo has the ring, and Gandalf is nervous about it, and he says to keep it secret, keep it safe. If you're really nerdy, uh, you know that the movie changed these lines. It's supposed to say, keep it safe, keep it secret, uh, but it's okay. The idea was you have, you have information that is so vital, so important, and, and even potentially dangerous, you need to protect it. Well, I begin with that illustration because for the most uh, of Jesus' three to three and a half year ministry, he would tell his disciples and he would tell people that he healed that they should keep his identity secret and safe. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of confusing at times. He would heal someone and say, don't tell anybody about this. Or he would be revealed in all of his glory at the Mount of Transfiguration and then, and then tell people to keep that private. Jesus was ministering to people. He was teaching. He was healing. And he went about for three and a half years. He's famous. But he was perpetually trying to avoid uh, a public upheaval. And we talked about recently where uh, they would come to try to force him to be king and he would reject that because he didn't come to be uh, the king that would deliver them from Rome. He came first to be a savior that would deliver them and us from their sins. And in order to avoid 
uh, an undesired upheaval among the people and uprising, he would perpetually be saying, now I've healed you, but please don't tell anyone about it. You've seen me in my glory, please don't tell anyone about it. Well, in our text today, in Luke 19, that is going to change very, very drastically. We are coming now to uh, Palm Sunday. We've been following Jesus as he's headed for Jerusalem, knowing exactly what awaits him. He's not going there as a victim. He's going there as a victor. He knows exactly what's going to happen, and he's predicted it. Now he's carrying it out. It's Sunday, and five days from now, he's going to be crucified. Uh, A week from now, he's going to be resurrected. We read today of the triumphal entry. And Jesus, at this point, is no longer keeping his messiahship, his identity, a secret. In fact, he is overtly going to say, I'm coming to Jerusalem in fulfillment of messianic prophecies, and people will know that what I'm doing is what has been predicted by Zechariah. And he's doing this to present himself as the Messiah, the the deliverer, the savior. I think part of it is he's doing this to intentionally provoke the religious elite who they've been opposing him, but now he's bringing it to a head. Do you remember there's other times in the Gospels where they wanted not only to take Jesus and make him king, but there were some who wanted to take Jesus and throw him off a cliff or in some other way kill him, and it wasn't yet his time, and he waited, he waited. Now he comes and he says, it's time. The time has come for me to to accomplish my mission, and I think part of the triumphal entry is an announcement that he's the Messiah. Part of it is uh, he's kind of poking the Pharisees and, and the Sanhedrin with a stick, and he's bringing about his own prophesied death. We read of that in Luke chapter 19. Now, I preached on this, uh, this very passage, back on Palm Sunday. Uh, So I thought about just skipping over this in our study through Luke. We're nearing the end. I thought, you know, in the last year I've addressed this, maybe I'll skip it and we'll just move on to the next text. But I'll tell you this. As many times as I've preached the triumphal entry, it's different when you're preaching it as it's kind of uh, coming as a climax from an entire book of Luke. We've been studying all the things that Jesus is doing and teaching. We've been studying that Jesus came to minister to outcasts. You know, we recently saw him uh, heal a blind man, and he, and he met with Zacchaeus, and he's criticized as being a friend of sinners, and he said he came to seek and to save the lost. He said he's going to Jerusalem. And I'm approaching this text differently than I did when it was uh, just a Palm Sunday text. This is bringing the entire book of Luke to a climax. So read it with fresh eyes, and we're reading three different kind of events from the life of Jesus in this passage, Luke 19, beginning at verse 28. Why don't we stand together out of reverence for the word? I'll read the text, and you follow along. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. (coughs) When he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you bringing it? Or why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as they rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you... Even you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side 
and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. They will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And entered the temple, began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple, and the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. This is the word of God, inspired profitable, sufficient, inerrant. Let's study it together. Please be seated. (coughs) Hosanna. Jesus saves. What a powerful passage we're studying today. So much emotion that is associated with it. There are crowds that are cheering. They believe that the time of the kingdom has come. We just talked about that last week. They're expecting Jesus to come and inaugurate his kingdom and and go to the throne and maybe drive the Romans out. So the people are very excited. Uh, Jesus has scripted this, and yet amid all of the shouting, and even amid the anger of the Pharisees, you you have a joyful people, you have angry Pharisees, and you have Jesus, and oddly, Uh, Seems like it's out of place, but when he gets a look at the city of Jerusalem, he weeps, he mourns, knowing what's coming and knowing that they've rejected him. It's a day that's teeming with emotion, and it teaches us many lessons. If I were to draw it to just one kind of pregnant sentence, it's that Jesus is the only hope for a broken and sinful world. There's so many directions we could go with this, but Jesus is the only hope. When they shout out Hosanna, they're calling for deliverance. They're calling for salvation. Jesus is presenting himself as the only Savior for a broken, sinful world. I used to be very skeptical about uh, what happened on, the, on Palm Sunday because I'm thinking, you know, that people are so fickle. They're praising Jesus as the deliverer on Sunday, and by Friday... The same city, if not the same people, would be crying out, crucify him, crucify him. So I look at their cries to him as the savior and deliverer, as fickle and (coughs) short-lived. But the reality is that in order to be the one bringing salvation, in order to be Hosanna, in order to be the deliverer, Friday had to happen. So there's there's not a disconnect between uh, their worship on Sunday, their crying out for deliverance, and Jesus' crucifixion on Friday. He had to be crucified in order to be the promised deliverer. He's the only hope for a broken and sinful world. So we look first at the triumphal entry. And very simply, I'm just giving this as a main point, that Jesus saves sinners. We've seen this again and again. It's, it, you know, I, I don't want my, my sermon outline to be the same regardless of the text we come to. Uh, We saw last week that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus saved sinners, but it fits. Jesus is the promised one, the deliverer, the savior. Jesus saves sinners. Triumphal entry is predicted in the Old Testament. So I want to look at it just very quickly because this isn't the meat of the sermon. uh, but, But very quickly, what's so important about Jesus riding on this young donkey, riding into the city? Uh, Jerusalem is on, is on one hill. We, we call it a mountain. Uh, that's because um, Luke had never been to Colorado. Uh, so these, these are not big mountains, all right? They're, they're hills, all right? And you can, you can picture it. Uh, there is Jerusalem on, on this hill, and then there's the Kidron Valley, and then over here there's the, the Mount of Olives. On the Mount of Olives, on the backside, you have Bethphage and Bethany, and, and then uh, coming down to the base of it, you have the Garden of Gethsemane, And we're not talking about a huge hike. It's not even like going up Stone Mountain. This is pretty small. It it wouldn't take a long time. I went from Jerusalem uh, down into the Kidron Valley, and it took about 10 minutes. Okay, but they're so close that the people of Jerusalem would be able to look across the Kidron Valley and see this parade coming down. And, you know, they're not coming straight down. There's a road now, and I imagine it was similar in Jesus' day, that has a bunch of switchbacks. You know when you're climbing mountains? 
Uh, they have a road that instead of going straight up a steep mountain, you're going back and forth turning. People in Jerusalem would be able to watch this. And Jesus, when, when he finally gets to a point where he could see the city, it, it was overwhelming to him. It was so emotional. He'd seen it many times, but now he's anticipating what's about to happen in the next week and what would happen a generation later. Past, present, and future. What's the significance of Palm Sunday? Well, there's Old Testament messianic prophecy, right? Big word messianic. Old Testament that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. Back from Zechariah 9, 9, we're not studying that at length today, but let me just uh, cite it for you. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Again, uh, the cultural elite among you are singing that like a soprano and Handel's Messiah. Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. So you have this prediction that the Messiah, the king, would come to his people in this particular way. So when Jesus tells his disciples, go to a city, get this colt, bring it to me, I'm going to ride into the city, he knows that he's fulfilling messianic prophecy from Zechariah. The people would know he's fulfilling messianic prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And yet you have so much happening here. Jesus is finally presenting himself without any question. Yes, I am the promised deliverer, the king, the savior, the Messiah. And, and he's, showing his, he's showing his omniscience. He knows exactly how this is going to go. You'll find the donkey tied here. You're going to be asked a question. Here's the answer. And it happens just like he predicted. There's so much happening here, but primarily it's a messianic prophecy. And we see a messianic fulfillment. The people see him and they're crying out to him, Hosanna, that means save now. All right, they're calling out to him as savior. And again, I'm not sure that they understood the kind of salvation he was bringing. They wanted salvation from uh, political and military suppression. They thought they needed to be delivered from Rome. They didn't know that the deliverance he came to bring was deliverance from sin. But they're calling out to him and spreading their garments, waving palm branches. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record this really eventful day. And then I say he has this inevitable praise. The Pharisees are offended. They say, don't you hear what people are saying? The idea is they're praising you as though you were God. You should stop them. And Jesus says, if they didn't praise me, the very rocks would cry out. All right? The idea is it is inevitable that the king of the universe will be praised. And if we don't do it, then the rest of creation will do it. He's going to be honored and glorified. So we have an Old Testament me uh, messianic prophecy or prediction, a New Testament fulfillment. And this is just a teaser. We're not uh, going very far with this, but you have a future messianic prophecy. Here, here when Jesus is arriving, coming to the Mount of Olives, He's looking back to the prophecy of Zechariah. He's fulfilling it in time, but there's also a prediction of his return. And we've talked about this before. The Mount of Olives is such a significant place. Jesus um, teaches the Olivet Discourse there that we read about uh, in Matthew 24 and 25. We'll have portions of it in Luke. Um, Jesus is going to be anointed at Bethany uh, by Mary as she prepares him for his crucifixion. Jesus is going to pray at the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's going to be arrested there. All of this is on the Mount of Olives. And then when he ascends into heaven, he ascends from the Mount of Olives. But there's something that is yet to come there, and that too is prophesied by Zechariah. It's his future arrival. The scripture speaks about this uh, only in this place, but it says, on that day. His feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. It's talking about kind of a cataclysmic event. But the main thing is when Jesus returns, he's returning to the Mount of Olives. And because of that prediction, the Mount of Olives is just covered in tombstones. It's, it's really not a beautiful place. You know, you picture, oh, it must be trees and green and lovely. No, it's, it's actually gray and blah. 
It, it has a bunch of tombs there. Because the Jews would say, if God is sending his deliverer to the Mount of Olives, I want to be there. That, you know, front row seat. I'll get to go to heaven first if I'm closest. So everybody packed in there because it's such a significant place. The Mount of Olives has past and present and future significance. Jesus will come again. Now, make no mistake, when he comes a second time, he's not coming in peace riding on a donkey. He's coming on a white stallion. He's coming to make war. Jesus saves sinners. Now, as part of this triumphal entry, we get to a point where he kind of comes over the brow of the Mount of Olives, and he has his view of Jerusalem. He'd seen it many times. It's not like he's, he's moved because it's the first sight. Uh, like if, if you were to travel and you saw what we call the holy city, it might, you know, kind of uh, put a lump in your throat or catch your breath. That's not what's happening because Jesus is just overwhelmed uh, by the vision, the, the vista of the city. Jesus sees Jerusalem and he weeps. Jesus weeps for sinners. I fought over how to word this. You know, should I say uh, Jesus loves sinners? You know, or, or, or some other word. And no, there's really no more accurate way to say uh, what's happening here than Jesus is weeping for sinners. You know, in John 11, we read that at the graveside of Lazarus, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in Scripture, two words, Jesus wept. But that wasn't a solitary time. Uh, Jesus was often overcome with emotion at the plight of people. Uh, we read of all these miracles that he does uh, in Matthew 8 and 9. And then he looks, over the, he looks over the crowd, the multitudes of people, and he has compassion. He's moved because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Here he looks at this city, and it's not like, you know, like his lip quivered a little bit and, and maybe his eyes grew misty. This is actually describing like his chest is heaving with deep emotion. He's mourning over this city. He's weeping. Specifically, he's weeping because of Jerusalem's coming destruction. You know, we talk about prophecies of Jesus riding on a colt into Jerusalem, and he did it. But there's another prophecy that Jesus is going to make in the text. And when we read it, Jesus is describing a time when Jerusalem would be sacked Jerusalem would be raised, Jerusalem would be destroyed, and people killed. And he talks about uh, them, uh, the enemy, the Romans, were going to come in and surround the city and totally devastate it, not even leaving one stone on top of another. And Jesus, knowing what's coming, predicting what's coming, what was accomplished in AD 70, weeps over it. He weeps over the hardness of his people. Do you remember that haunting a statement from John 1, I believe, verse 11, it says, he came unto his own and, finish it with me, he came unto his own and his own received him not. Luke keeps telling us that Gentiles would believe in Jesus, outcasts, lepers, blind people, Zacchaeus, publicans would receive Jesus. But he came unto his own people and his own people rejected him. They didn't receive him. And Jesus looks over the city and he's so moved with compassion that he weeps. That's the kind of God we serve. He is five days from being betrayed and forsaken and arrested and spit upon and derided. He's, he's days away from having his beard plucked out, thorns put on his brow and, and knocked down so that it would enter into his flesh, into his skull. He'd bleed. He's days away from, from being whipped and tormented, his visage marred more than any other man. He's days away from being nailed to a cross, dying a terrible death. And worse than all of that, he's days away from being forsaken by his own father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And yet he's weeping for Jerusalem. He's weeping for sinners. You know, I, I enjoy the song uh, that says, you know, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. It has a second verse that says, 
For me it was in the garden, he prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. All right, I actually think that probably is reversed. When he's in Gethsemane and weeping and overwhelmed, I think it is for himself, not for us. But this weeping, this weeping was weeping for sinners. Jesus wept. Jesus is arriving to praise and pomp and circumstance, and he sorrows, revealing to us the the heart of the Father. I addressed this when I preached this last Palm Sunday, but there's a doctrine, and there's there's good reason for it. There's doctrine about uh, the impassibility of God. The idea is that God cannot suffer. God cannot have loss. So we read this text, and the idea is Jesus could weep, Jesus could mourn, Jesus could grieve because he was man. But God wouldn't grieve that way. I just disagree. I disagree at this point. Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. Okay? God is invisible. No one has seen him, but Jesus has come to reveal him, to explain him. And all through John's gospel especially, he came to show us what God is like. So even in Hebrews 1, God has spoken to us at other times through the the prophets, but in these last days he's spoken to us through the coming of his son. What I'm saying is when we see Jesus grieving over the condition of the lost, I don't think we just see the incarnate God grieving But the Father and the Spirit, they don't care so much. No, I think you're seeing the heart of God. God grieves over the plight and the hardness and the rebellion of sinners. Not like you're punishing him. Not like he's weak. But he's so gracious. He's so compassionate. I think we're seeing the heart of God. And even in Ezekiel, you have this description of coming judgment but it says on a couple of occasions in Ezekiel 18, 23 and Ezekiel 33, 11, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. All right, when the wicked are judged, God is not like, hey, they had it coming. Hey, did you guys see that? Wow, blood everywhere. That was amazing. No, you have, you have a God who is just and righteous and he will bring judgment on the wicked. It's going to happen. But he doesn't delight in it. He delights in mercy. I quoted last week, I'll quote it again, John 3, 17. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He delights in mercy. He delights in salvation. And he will bring judgment, but he doesn't do it with joy. Jesus weeping over the rebellious city of Jerusalem, the very city that would crucify him, he weeps for them. He's showing us the heart of God. Father, Son, and Spirit, they grieve at our rebellion. They grieve even at our coming judgment. It's so interesting to me to think about our ministry. I think about my ministry. To think about how I interact with my neighbors. To think about how I uh, want to give the gospel to the lost. When's the last time that you're praying for the salvation of a neighbor or you're praying for the salvation of a family member, when's the last time that you were so moved with a burden for them that it brought you to tears? That, That you cared so deeply about the fact that they were lost, they were going to be damned, they were they were hellbound, and you're so grieved by that it it caused you to to have to swallow hard. Do you think of sinners that way? We'll talk to missionaries. And we'll say, you know, the primary thing that sends you to the field shouldn't be compassion for the lost because that will probably wax and wane. There will be a time you don't love them, you don't even like them. That's not what keeps you on the field. You go to the field For the sake of Jesus' name, you go for God's glory. So John Piper would write in his classic uh, missions book, Let the Nations Be Glad. He says, missions happen because worship doesn't. The idea is we're going out as missionaries so that 
rebels will be turned to worshipers and God will be glorified. Our ultimate goal in evangelism is the glory of God. I agree. We, we do ministry of, of any kind primarily for God's glory. So put it this way. If you only go to the mission field out of compassion, there might come a time when you're, you don't feel love for those people. You actually are, are very frustrated with them. And the thing that holds you there is your love for God and his call on your life. I, I agree. We call it like a, a dox, doxological approach to, to missions. Doxology, the glory of God, the praise of God. We go to the mission field so God will be praised. Beautiful, true. But we do go to the lost, moved by compassion for them. We should be looking at sinners, realizing they're living somewhere forever, heaven or hell, and if they don't hear about Jesus Christ, it will certainly be hell, and there should be a compassion that actually propels us into ministry. There should be a compassion that opens our mouth to tell the gospel. We have neighbors who are lost, and we'll talk to them about sports, we'll talk to them about COVID-19, we'll talk to them about politics, but we don't talk to them about the gospel because we have no compassion. How hard must we be to not be urgently sharing the gospel with people who are damned? And it doesn't do to say, well, technically, you know, evangelism is motivated by the glory of God, not by the needs of men. It's both. We, we minister for the glory of God, but we minister because people are lost and going to hell. When I was a student at Bob Jones University, uh, there was a time where Dr. Bob III would start a sentence and have us finish it, kind of like I did today. And he would say, the most sobering reality in the world today is that, and some of you were there, do you remember? You want to finish it? The most sobering reality in the world today is that people are dying and going to hell today. That's power. And then you have theology students. I don't know if that's really the most sobering reality. The most sobering reality is that God isn't uh, exalted as he ought to be. Just shut up. Are you overthinking this? People are going to hell. Don't, don't argue about whether that's primary or secondary. People are going to hell today. Does it matter to you? you know, do, do people just frustrate you? You get in Atlanta traffic and, and it's it's agitating, and we're, that's one part of life that is starting to get back to normal, is Atlanta traffic. Or you see a stadium of people, or you, you see mobs, masses of people. Does it frustrate you? Oh, this is going to take all day. Or is there a sense in which I'm looking at thousands of people, and, and most of them are on the broad way that leads to destruction? God, save these people. Do you have a heart for the lost? We read all through the scriptures of Paul, and Paul's a genius, and Paul would be willing to fight, but many times he talks about the tears that he shed. He says, Timothy, remember my tears for you. Or at our parting, there was tears. Or he'll speak to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, remember my tears for you. Paul was so moved by the needs of people that it came out in his ministry. And that kind of ministry is, it, it has a different flavor to it, a different feel to it. I've had times where I needed to rebuke someone. I was so nervous because I'm going to tell this, this individual some really tough news. It was a man that wasn't being uh, recommended for leadership, although he'd been in our church a long time. And, um, and every year it would come up and there were some, there were some gaps, some blind spots. And uh, I was uh, kind of nominated to be a spokesman and go to the man and, and tell him, listen, we love you, but but here's some, some areas to work on. And I knew it was going to crush him. I go to the man. I'm nervous. I hate, I hate confrontation. I was so burdened about it. I go to him and, and, and was moved to tears. I love you. Love your family. Here's some things you need to hear. And I'm, I'm visibly shaken. Tears in my eyes. He, he absorbed it. He took it. Took all of it. And part of it is, he knew I wasn't relishing the moment. Have you ever had someone correct you and it seemed like, man, you're kind of enjoying this. Like, like this, is, this is fun to you? You know, there should be a sense in which we're saying, man, I, I'm burdened. Paul would say that day and night with tears, he was burdened for people. It leaves a mark. 
There was a time when I was in high school dating a girl. Uh, my parents uh, probably weren't thrilled about it, uh, but we're dating nonetheless. And then uh, I break up with her, saw her at school with some other guy, held it together, got home to mom. And she says, hey, Chris, how was your day? And I'm, I'm a guy that, number one, I'm way too emotional. Uh, number two, I can kind of hold it in unless I try to speak. It's so hard at funerals because you might sit there and be emotional at a funeral. I have to actually talk. So my mom says, Chris, you know, how was your day? It was fine. <laughs> and just the dam broke and emotions are flowing. And I know deep in her soul, my mom's going, yes. You know, this relationship is over. Cha-ching, my prayers have been answered. I'm crying, un, you know, just uncontrollably, inconsolably. Mom didn't know what to do, didn't know what to say. She hugs me. And about 20 seconds later, I feel her sobbing. I mean, she was happy, but she's sobbing. And I asked her, like, what was that about? You know, I, I know you're not crazy about this relationship. Why were you crying? She says, I was crying for you. I was crying with you. I was feeling for my son who was feeling. And, you know, you look back and say, well, that was stupid that you were so emotional. I know. But when you, when you care, when you're, when you're engaged, it's reflected at least sometimes in emotion. Spurgeon has a classic book called The Soul Winner. And he writes this telling statement, the Lord Jesus Christ wept over Jerusalem and you will have to weep over sinners if they are to be saved through you. I'm not, I'm not telling you to be artificial, to be melodramatic. I'm not talking to you about a strategy. You know, I've, I've, seen, I've seen preachers that I, I shouldn't judge uh, motives, but I've seen preachers that that have this it almost seems to be contrived emotion, and you know dramatically pull out a handkerchief and wipe themselves off and and gather their breath and you know maybe they are just that emotional. I'm not saying you you have to be weeping when you share the gospel. I guess what I'm saying is less than an outflow of emotion. There ought to be something in your heart that is urgent. We read of someone like Spurgeon, or we read of somebody like, uh, famously, George Whitfield, would preach, and he, he was such a compelling communicator. He had a voice that could speak to tens of thousands of people at once, but he would speak with such emotion. There's a sense in which I'm weeping for you because you don't know enough to weep for yourselves. There's an urgency. We weep for sinners after the example of the Lord Jesus. He predicts the fall of Jerusalem. It's so terrible. In fact, um, when we were studying Psalm 74, we're studying a lament over the fall of Jerusalem in 586. We talk about how brutal it was. And now it's about to happen again in AD 70. In 586, the Babylonians came in and they wiped out the city and the temple. And in AD 70, the Romans come in, they wipe out the city, they, they destroy the temple. Jesus mourns, he weeps. Now when Jesus is arriving at the end of the triumphal entry, he comes to Jerusalem and the crowds are thinking that this is the moment we've waited for, he's going to lead a revolution against the Romans, and no, 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 no. He's on a rescue mission to save us from our sins. So he doesn't go to the palace, he doesn't go you know, to some marketplace to raise a crowd and a call to arms. Jesus enters the city, hears all of the praise. He is weeping. Now he comes into the city, and where does he go? We read at the end of Luke 19 that Jesus cleanses the temple. So he goes in, he sees those who are selling in the temple. They're especially selling because this is Passover season. All of these families uh, would need to come in and and buy a sacrifice. And these money changers, the idea is that they might be coming uh, with, with different money from different locations and they needed it to be changed. It's just like when you travel internationally at the airport 
you know, as soon as you land at the airport, there's all these banks that are willing to do currency changes. That's what's happening in the temple. So you bring money from outside, uh, you come to Jerusalem, you can change it so then you can make a purchase uh, for sacrifice. It's not that that in itself was immoral, but it's happening on this temple mound, and Jesus is grieved by it. He began to drive them out. Look at verse 45. He began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. There's an entire study uh, just on Jesus' words there where he says, My house. There's there's an earlier uh, cleansing of the temple that we read about in John 2. So Jesus' first act in his ministry is cleansing the temple And he is zealous for his father's house. So you have a book in at the beginning of his ministry. He cleanses the temple. He's zealous for his father's house. Here we have him cleansing the temple during the last week of his life before the crucifixion. And he's zealous for my house. And then we read at the end of Matthew 23 that at the end of this week he's going to wash his hands. And he says, I am leaving your house to you desolate. So the temple is is God the father's house. The temple is God's son house. And by the end he says... We have nothing to do with this. You're on your own. This is your house. This is idolatry. In in fact, it occurred to me even driving in this morning. In 586, you have the temple and and the Jews decimated, as as I discussed, and their primary sin was idolatry. Here they had the true God, and he had warned them, don't go after the idols of the nations around you. And they worshiped idols, and God rejected them. In AD 70, they weren't worshiping idols. There there wasn't, you know, some heathen gods that had come in. They were supposedly worshiping Jehovah, but not according to the scriptures. And in AD 70, they are judged for their idolatry, even though they're not bowing down to to stone or, or molten images. They're calling out on the name of God, but not with understanding. They've rejected the Messiah. They're Jewish idolaters. Broken, rejected. Now Jesus comes. He cleanses the temple the second time. And I, again, labored over how to put this final point. I I landed on Jesus shelters sinners. My first choice was Jesus judges sinners. So he's so compassionate, but now he comes to the temple and he's driving people out. He's bringing judgment. But I, I think that's the wrong emphasis. When Jesus comes to the temple... It's less about judging sinners and it's more about sheltering sinners. And let me explain what I mean. I I thought about using the word welcome uh, or invites or protects, and I I settled on shelters. And you say, Pastor, we don't care. Uh, The only person that cares about your sermon outline is you. I understand. But the point of emphasis matters. Was he coming? defending God's house, bringing judgment on these evil sinners? Or was he coming, as we've been reading all through Luke, he came to seek and to save the lost. He is a friend of publicans and sinners. He's compassionate. He keeps defending people from religious abuses. He keeps defending publicans and tax collectors and and children and and outcast, he's defending them from the religious elite all through this book. And now on the day of the triumphal entry, he goes to the temple and he drives out the people who are selling. And it's not primarily that he's protecting the temple. It's primarily that he's saying, get all this garbage out of the way so that people can come and pray, so that people can come and worship. So I put it this way. He's more interested in people than in place. Yes, he was zealous for the holy place, for God's name. But he was also zealous, maybe more zealous, for another abuse of sinners. He kept saying to the Pharisees, you know, you blind guides. It's not enough that you're going to destruction. You're leading others with you. And then you're oppressing them with all these laws that you don't even obey, but you're oppressing them. They're they're trying to earn salvation by not only obeying the Scripture, and they'll never be able to do that, but they're also trying to obey all your added rules 
you are oppressing these people with religion. I think Jesus cleansing the temple, he's come to deliver us. Hosanna, deliverer, savior. Yes, I've come to deliver you from sin. And frankly, I've come to deliver you from dead, formal religion. I've come to deliver you from hypocrisy. Religion had been turned to merchandise. This was supposed to be a quiet place. This was supposed to be a place of prayer. And again, in our Psalm 74 study, Solomon's temple, they didn't even come in and like chisel the stones. They would do that off site so that when they came to build Solomon's temple, it was quiet and reverent. Now you come to worship and, and it's, it's ridiculous. You have the, the bleeding of sheep. You have this agora. Have you ever been to a flea market in, in another country and there's all kinds of bartering and there's, it's just loud and it's, it's fun, but not at the place of prayer. There was a Palm Sunday maybe five, six years ago and um, I asked a few plants in the audience, when I reach this point, I want you to stand up and start shouting, uh, start bartering, you know, hey, you know, hot dogs for sale, peanuts, popcorn, Cracker Jacks, and, and they're, they're looking at me like, you, right in the service, you want us to do this. I'm like, yeah, please. You know, I double dog dare you, do this. Uh, one of them was Stacy Mock, and he is, uh, he, he does, what's the word I'm looking for? He's an auctioneer. So he stands up and he starts like auctioning, and, and you say, why would you do that? because it was so unnerving and, and startling. And we're in church, and all of a sudden, these guys are trying to hawk their wares. Exactly. That's what's happening at the temple. People are coming to worship, and it's just this giant flea market. And Jesus wasn't primarily worried about the Holy of Holies. This is supposed to be a place of prayer. People come here when, when they need assistance. They come here to seek God. You've turned it into a circus. And I think it's, I believe this is accurate. We don't have a, an exact description of this, but the idea is that they're probably doing all of this, not in the temple itself, but there's a huge temple complex. There's a huge courtyard. And you had one area called the court of the Gentiles. And wouldn't it be just like the Jews to say, the court of the Gentiles, ah, that's not important. Let's put our animals there. Let's sell over there. So they're not just driving people away. They're driving the Gentiles out. The Gentiles who already are so distant are being driven even further away. So when Jesus comes, and it gets back to that point about ministry and missions, he's zealous for the glory of God, but he's also compassionate on people who are being hindered from coming. And it's not either or, it's both. He's zealous for the glory of God. He's compassionate on the needy. And he says, all your stupid marketing ploys are driving worshipers away. So Jesus gets angry and he drives them out. So many, so many lessons for us. You know, this is far from adequate, but just some that pop to my mind. I ask you, do you prioritize the gospel over politics and power. You know, here we are in election season, and it matters. You know, pray, exert influence. I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. You know, I'm not saying it's a, uh, it's a shallow thing to be involved in politics. You pray and you judge as somebody that believes the Bible and fears God. But are you more passionate about that or other social issues than you are about the gospel? You know, are, are you more eager to influence the way people vote than to influence whether they're going to heaven or hell? And if so, you're out of line. And you say, where do you get that from this passage? I get that from Jesus coming not to bring political revolution. He came to bring salvation. His priority was on the eternal needs of sinners, not bringing about, you know, an improved situation for them as as they journey on their way to hell. Do you prioritize the gospel or politics and power? Do you worship as you were made and saved to do? 
If we won't worship, the very rocks will cry out. God's going to be worshipped. Do you worship as he made you to do? And then we sin, but then he saves us. It's all about his exaltation. Do we worship him with devotion? Do you weep for the lost? Pastor, I don't weep for anything. Right? Don't brag about that. Is your heart moved by the reality that people are dying and going to hell today? Do you weep for the lost locally, internationally? Do you value the church? Here Jesus is cleansing the temple so people could get together to worship, so people could come and pray. Just move all this clutter, move all these barriers, and let's call people to worship. Do you value the church? I might say, do you value worship, corporate worship, prayer meeting? Do you long for the perfect king? Remember back in Zechariah 9, Jesus is coming on a donkey into the city. He says, behold your king. Brandon said last week in our study of Judges that you, you reach the end of Judges and you realize we need a better leader than Samson. We need a better leader than Ehud. We need a real king. We, we need a better king. We get, to the end of, we get to the end of the entire Old Testament. And between the Testaments, you, you might actually you know, jot on, on this blank page, we need a better king than anything that happened in the Old Testament. We need a better prophet. We need a better sacrifice. We need a better priest. The Old Testament ends and you say, we need a better king than what we've ever had, right? We need Jesus. And I would say in a, in a politically charged environment, um, Vote and care and be active and exert influence. It's all good. Be salt and light in that way. But the hope, the hope of the world is not in a candidate, political party. The hope of the world is Christ. The king that we really need is, is King Jesus. So yes, exert influence as you can. And, and even the Apostle Paul would use his his liberties as a Roman citizen, do that. But you long for King Jesus, deliverer, savior, come and help us. Thank you for coming the first time to deal with sin. Thank you for coming yet again to fix this broken world. Let me say again, Jesus is the only hope for a broken, sinful world. If you don't know him as savior, your greatest need is to cry out, Jesus, I'm a sinner. You died for me. Thank you. Save me. Have mercy on me. I'm sorry for my sin. Save my wretched soul. He'll do it. If you're a Christian, allow the Lord to use this message, this powerful word from Scripture, to affect you, to change you for God's glory. Thank you, Lord, for the truth. I pray that you will use it in our lives, that we won't just hear it and, and go on the rest of the day, the rest of the week unchanged. Pray that it will stick, convict us where necessary. And motivate, move us, inspire us where necessary. Do your work through your word. We praise you. We praise you that we have a great king in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his promised return. Uh, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing two songs. I couldn't decide. We're going to sing two. One by Wesley. Rejoice, the Lord is king. And then we will end with There is a Higher Throne, maybe my favorite modern hymn. All right, whatever is happening in the world around us, God reigns. He's sovereign. And Jesus is king. Let's worship him together.
without any accompaniment, all glory, wisdom, power. All glory, wisdom, power. Can't wait. It's going to happen. Come, Lord Jesus. Man, it's been a joy to worship with you this morning. We'll go ahead and be dismissed. As usual, I'll ask uh, that you sit tight for a few minutes and allow those who need more distancing for health reasons or other preferences to get out first. And then uh, if you have masks, mask up, and then we can fellowship together. God bless you. Love you. Dismissed.